Now we'll continue. We'll finish off this uh, this worksheet, and this will be a kind of a warm up for some more general stuff with differential forms. This will be the last thing we'll do back just with plain old vector fields. Um, theorem one. Let me take you back to theorem one. Scroll up. Back to the vector field language. If f is a divergence-free vector field, define a nice on all of our three. So we're doing the special case where we haven't taken anything out. We're not just using that it's two connected. We're going to go ahead and use that it. it's all of our three for simplicity. Then there's a vector field uh, g such that f is a curl of g. So any divergence-free vector field is a curl if you haven't taken anything out of R3. Well, there is actually an explicit construction of that. Um, when I wrote this, this uh, worksheet up, I put this as extra credit because we, we didn't really take this anywhere. We didn't say, well, what is the, scheme, the general scheme? What's the generalization? Now that I'm doing the differential form stuff, there is a nice general, generalization. So this is actually a good warm up for something. It might seem rather random, though, OK? We say g3 equals 0, first of all. Well, that's nice and simple. OK, turns out we don't actually need all three components. Um, that's partly because of all the freedom we have to choose g. And so we don't actually have to make it, as make it super general. g2 is a certain integral. We take f1, the i component of f, and we integrate it from 0 to z. Um, and we, we put the third coordinate as a variable when we integrate it. And we do a similar thing to get g1, but we use f2 and f3. And we integrate f3 in the y variable and f2 in the z variable. OK. Hmm. OK. Well, all we need to do is we need to just verify that the curl of g is equal to f. OK. Well, let's see. OK. Is this true? Well, let's go ahead and just calculate out the curl g. OK. Well, let's just do it component by component. First of all, we're going to take. The, par uh, the partial derivative of g3 with respect to x2 minus the partial derivative of g2 with respect to, oh, that's not what I wanted, x3. Okay. And that's going to be the first component <coughs> of the curl. Um, and that's hopefully going to be f1. OK. So that's going to be, let's just, let me just copy that. Now g3 is 0, so that's just going to die. That's nice. Now g2 is this thing. OK, the minus signs are going to cancel. OK. And now I have to deal with how um, derivatives and integrals interact. This is one of the ways they're going to interact. This is the derivative with respect to the third variable of an integral in the third variable. OK. So the um, x3, I guess I'm kind of mixing up x, 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 y, and z here. Let's actually, I guess I'm using just, uh, yeah, let me just do x, y, and z. I've gotten so used to doing numerical subscripts, I forgot I just used letters here. OK. So now this is a derivative, and that same variable appears in the the, um, the limits of the integrand. That's one of the versions of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The derivative of an integral with a variable upper, upper limit is just exactly what you have in here with that evaluated. Hey, we're done. That's, that's right, right on. OK. Now what about if I take the um, derivative of g, uh, let's see, g1 with respect to z and g3 with respect to x. OK, that's going to be, I'm just cyclically permuting the coordinates. The 3 got promoted to a 1, the y got promoted to a z, the 2 got promoted to a 3, and the z got promoted to an x cyclically. So that should be f2. Let's see what that is. OK, so I'm going to copy that in. Now g3, again, is 0, so it dies. And g1, OK, that's a little more complicated. Put that in parentheses. See what happens. OK. But, OK, so d by dz of the z here, that's going to be fundamental theorem of calculus. OK. And so that's just going to be f2 of x, y, z. Oh, hey, that's what I wanted. But what about this other part? Is this going to screw us up? Well, let's look. This is the derivative with respect to z of something where, notice, this is a little different from this guy. The z coordinate has been set to 0. So there's no z dependence in here or in here. So there's nothing to do. The derivative is going to be 0, and we got f2. We're good to go. Okay. 
Now the last one is where it is the most interesting one. G, uh, let's see, I'm going to promote this to a 2. Oops, still, still subscript though. Promote this to an X, promote this to a 1, and promote this to a Y. Okay, this should end up being F3. Let's see if it is. Okay, let's copy and paste this thing in. Okay, d by dx of g2, well that's not 0, it's this thing. And let's move the minus out so it doesn't look like subtraction. Okay. And then dg1 gy, dy, okay, that's the complicated thing. That's going to be parentheses and then copy this in. Okay. Now, this is where we have to think about, uh, again about integrals, but in a different way. This is something you might not have ever had to do before, depending on where you are in mathematics. We've got an integral in this variable, this, this third variable, the z-coordinate here, and that's what's varying. Um, but then I'm taking the derivative, but it also depends on x and y. These guys are not variable as far as the integral process is concerned, but once the integration is done, the x and y do affect the answer, and so this, this thing is a function of x, y, and z. It's a function of x and y because these are in here, a function of z because it's in here. Well, I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. That's not the variable of integration. It's not something up here. It's not the t. It's uh, essentially a, param a parameter variable in terms of here. Well, I claim that you can just pass such integrals through, such derivatives through integrals. The reason, basically, I'm not going to give you the proof, and there's a, f a few technicalities involved, but the reason, basically, is that this is just an overgrown sum. And the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. I know that there's really a limit process involved here, but that limit process has nothing to do with the variable x. And it turns out that unless you're in a kind of a, a nasty example with like improper integrals, that this is just going to be the derivative. The derivative actually just passes in here. OK. And then we'll see in a minute why that's so useful. OK. Now what else? d by dy, ooh, same deal. This is going to be the integral uh, minus the integral from 0 to z. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to copy 0 to z. And the d by dy is going to come in here. And this might start looking interesting. Hey, b d by dx of f1, d by dy of f2. Hmm, that's very interesting. And then plus, OK, d by dy. Now the y dependence is in the integral. That's where ftc comes in. OK. So d by dy, we're going to get plus from that canceling, and that's just going to be f3 of x, and then I put the y in where the t is, and then the other thing is a 0. OK, that's very interesting. Now what can I do with that? Well, these are both, this is minus the integral from 0 to z of the combination here, plus that's two-thirds of the of the divergence. But what do I know? I know the divergence is equal to 0. And then I have this f3 of x0, x y0. Okay. I know the divergence is equal to 0. So actually, I'm going to put the minus inside here. Minus d by dx of f1 and d by dy of f2, that's going to be equal to the other derivative. Let me copy and paste everything. I can replace this with positive d by dz of f3. Here I finally used the fact that it's divergence free. Okay, So let me just make that clear. That is since the sum of all these guys, these two plus this one, is the divergence. And that was assumed to be equal to 0. And we know that if the divergence hadn't been 0, there's no way we could possibly do this. No matter how clever we are with our integrals and fundamental theorems and passing stuff through weights through stuff, there's no way we're going to get that f is the curl of g because that's a, it's a necessary condition to have the divergence being 0. So we had to use this at some point. And here's maybe the somewhat unexpected way that we ended up using it. OK, we're still not quite done, though. We'll go back up here. Now we use the other fundamental theorem of calculus. This is a great workout with derivatives and integrals. We've seen three things, two versions of the fundamental theorem and the ability to pass a, vari uh, a derivative in a different variable through an integral, which is a pretty novel thing. Here, the other version of the fundamental theorem says the integral of a derivative is the original function evaluated at the top, 
f3 of xyz, hey, guess that's what? That's exactly what we wanted. Minus f3, evaluate at the bottom. xy0, oh yeah, it's going to cancel. It's very, very slick. And that is exactly what we want. f3 evaluated, whoops, not uh, xyz. OK, and so we got f1, f2, and f3. And this one was definitely the hard one. We had to do a lot more here than just very simple uh, FTC calculations. But it worked, and it did use that the divergence was 0, which we knew had to come in somewhere. It should not work for an arbitrary vector field f, but it does work for a divergence-free vector field. It's pretty cool, but you might wonder, how the heck did I come up with this? Where did this come from? And that's a great place where differential forms actually come in. Um, and to, to, to provide a more general background for why would anybody ever figure this out.